I'm joined by December and Ben from our team. And of course, um, my partner in crime, Tim Williams, the head of Oregon Film. So welcome everybody. And then we have um, three folks from New York that uh, are wonderful and are gonna talk to us a little bit about what they're seeing on the distribution landscape. Um, as you all know, we, we've launched back into Venice, we've launched back into Toronto, and then last night was the opening of the New York Film Festival. So we're starting to see signs of life on the festival circuit. And we're also getting ready to go into fall and winter. And we just had a really interesting call today with our friends at Sundance about what they're doing. So there, there is hope and there's a lot of things getting ready to start up. Um, and I think it's gonna be great to hear from Kyle and Kendra and Chris about what they're seeing on the ground from you know this last few weeks of festivals starting back up and then what they're seeing on the horizon. So a special welcome to Chris and to Kendra and to Kyle. A uh, couple housekeeping things before we get started. We, um, we welcome questions. We have a chat box and we know how to use it. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we go. Um, Chris, Kendra, and Kyle will talk with us for probably the first 15, 20 minutes just so we can get to know them a little bit, get to know their thoughts, and then we'll open it up to questions. We do tape this every week. Um, we send it out to all 120,000 of our newsletter subscribers so that if you missed it, um, you can watch it and see what's going on. And I have to say, um, it's been really heartening of late because as many of you know, Northwest Film Center is its own entity, but we are um, very much partnered with the Portland Art Museum, especially at this time. And there's so many folks on the Portland Art Museum side that have been so excited uh, about these happy hours, about hearing from you all in the community, about hearing from our different speakers, because as we know, um, cinema is an art form too. And we wanna make sure that it is thriving here in Portland and thriving as a good partner um, nationally as well. So we wanna, we wanna make sure that we are, um, we are spreading the word, not just to the 40 tried and true folks that show up every week, but really making sure that it gets out to our wider community. So without further ado, Ben and Tim, do you wanna talk about anything or should we have our, our guest speakers launch into who they are and what they do and all that happy goodness? No, I take it. You said it all very well. I second your motion. Thank you. Oh, approved. All right. <laughs> All right, so I am going to go with the ladies first model and ask Kendra if she would be kind enough to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and um, I'm going to start it off with a bright spot that you're seeing either out in the film world or out in the world that's inspiring you right now. Great, thank you. Um, so I am the Director of Strategy and Innovation at Women Make Movies, and uh, the organization is based in New York, but I am based in Massachusetts. I was remote most of the time even before COVID, um, so it actually made the transition to working remotely easy for our team because they'd already figured out how to work with me in that way. Um, I came from 18 years of directing distribution and marketing at the Media Education Foundation, which is predominantly an educational um, distrib distributor, film distributor, but I had done that, that work and brought that with me to Women Make Movies. And as <clears throat> while I'm working in a larger capacity than just distribution and, and promotion, I'm focused on that at Women Make Movies. Um, so I'm helping with acquisitions as well as the um, the promotion of each of the campaigns and and um, I think we'll you want to wait for a minute to talk about kind of what's shifted right before we so I'll, I'll leave that I'll tell you more like kind of some of the things the more specific things that I've been doing during COVID when we get to that part. Um, bright spot. Um, I feel like there's lots of bright spots actually I've um, I had I had conversations with three different filmmakers today, and they were all really great, hopeful conversations. Um, people who are doing really good work, really good social justice work, and I think the the role that film can play in um, advancing the dialogue around who has access. I feel like. I don't know if it's COVID related or if it's more about the, the everything that's happened around Black Lives Matter, but there's just, there's a space right now 
for that conversation that feels really exciting. And everybody that I'm talking to um, who has films on topics related, just there's just a lot of really good energy. And we have been being met well um, with people are we the, on the ground. People want to see those films and want to talk about those films right now. Thank you, Kendra. If you could, before we go on to Chris, if you could also just let folks know what Women Makes Mo Make Movies are. I think there's probably some folks on the call that know it and love it and have the tattoo, but then there's some folks that it might be new to. So if you don't mind uh, sharing what, what it is. Yes, thank you. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we have two different program areas. One of them is a production assistance program where we act as the fiscal sponsor for emerging filmmakers and, and or ongoing filmmakers, established filmmakers who just need a fiscal sponsor so that they can um, get funding from foundations and tax deductible donations from individuals and we also offer webinars and mentoring and consulting for our filmmakers in the production assistance program and then we have a distribution catalog and we acquire we acquire films some of which come out of our PA program and others that we find at festivals and such and um, then we distribute them to colleges, universities predominantly, but a lot of um, a lot of museums, a lot of cultural institutions, a lot of community screenings, and um, the festival circuits that are, you know, we, we, help, we help with films to do that kind of semi-theatrical. Thank you. On to Chris Wells. Hi, Chris. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Chris Wells. I'm the director of sales for Kino Lorber. Kino Lorber is at this point, uh, one of the longest existing independent film companies in America. It used to be Kino International that was founded by Don Krim and my boss, Richard Lorber, bought the company about 10 years ago or so. It's been Kino Lorber ever since then. And we are an independent film company with a lot of different arms. We do distribution of new first run art house independent, doc, foreign films, prestige kind of things. We have a huge home video business, shockingly. Home video still makes a ton of money for us. You'd be surprised to know. And that's a big part of our business. We do educational sales and non-theatrical as well. Um, I'm on the theatrical side. So I come, my background is I was in exhibition for a long time. I worked at a couple different art house theaters here in New York. I worked for the IFC Center for about 10 years, and then I programmed the Quad Cinema, which is owned by Charles Cohen, who owns all the landmark theaters now in New York. And then I made the switch after being an exhibition for a long time to go to distribution. And I'm actually uh, very thankful right now that I made that switch when I did. Um, <laughs> all of the theaters that I used to work for have been closed for six months. And uh, the distribution company I'm working for is actually thriving. We're doing very well right now because we've had to adapt uh, quickly and on our feet, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about um, what's happened with that. Uh, I also produce movies too, so there are probably a lot of filmmakers around as well, so I can speak to some of those questions. Uh, I had a movie in Toronto last year called Anne at 13,000 Feet that Cinema Guild bought uh, and will be coming out later this year. So what I do for the, the first run stuff for Kino Lorber is I, it's similar not to steal Kyle's Thunder, but we do the same job. We are the ones who are putting the movies in movie theaters. So we are the ones who are directly talking to the programmers at theaters around the country and trying to get them to play our movies. Uh, easier said than done sometimes because the movies that we distribute, we work for companies that are committed to doing interesting and challenging work. And sometimes those are not the things that are the first movies that people want to play. So that is what we're doing on a day-to-day -day business. We are talking to hundreds of art house theaters around the country uh, now who are closed and attempting to work with them in a new way, which we will talk about. But previously it was trying to get them to book our films. Uh, the things that we've done this year, movies like Baccarat, the Brazilian film, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, a documentary adaptation of Thomas Piketty's New York Times bestseller. We have Martin Eden coming up soon, which is a uh, my favorite movie of the year, a beautiful sweeping Italian epic that was in the New York and Toronto film festivals last year. So we are still releasing movies at a steady clip, but we're doing it virtually. And I just sort of want to tease that a little bit because we'll get into all the specifics of it in a little bit. And I think the, the bright spot, I would say, 
is that, well, we're still in business and a bunch of other companies are still in business, which is really good. And, you know, you don't want any of this to have happened, but it has forced a lot of people to adapt and think on their feet and reconsider stodgy old ways of how our business works um, on every level. I think a lot of things were really set in their ways and this has upended everything, not just in film, but in every industry. And so everyone from distributors to exhibitors to producers has been forced to think really creatively now about how do we find solutions? And sometimes those are doing things that we never thought that we would be doing, but maybe are things that are long overdue and needed to have happened for a long time. So I think that that's actually very exciting where a lot of the directions that we've been moving in and like I said, we can get into that more in a bit. Do you have a bright spot or is that your bright spot, Chris? That's the, that's the bright spot. That's I, I think that spot. everyone's been like kind of adapting and movie theaters now have a virtual component and distributors are looking in new ways to release movies and everyone's being forced to realign and reconsider what they're doing. Because, you know, there's no more old fashioned business than the art house movie theater business. It's been kind of operating in a very similar way for decades, if not a century. And it's, this has really been an enormous jolt to the system. Um, and though it's been really hard for a lot of people, I think it has forced us to think outside the box in certain ways. Outstanding. And, you know, a lot of those films, including Anne, which you produced, um, were featured at the Portland International Film Festival. And I'll just, I'll, I'll say that December has been hard at work with Ben and others on the team. We have a very special announcement, aren't they all, but a very special <laughs> announcement that, um, as you know, we didn't cancel PIF, we postponed it. So keep your eye out early next week because a number of those films that Chris mentioned, as well as some, some surprises, will be coming to you in October. Dun, 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 dun. All right, Kyle, you're up. That is a hard act to follow. No, it's not. You're, you've got the hair, you've got the poster yeah. behind you. You're yeah, all yeah. over this. Yeah. So um, my name's Kyle Westfall. I'm actually in Chicago. Um, and I work for the Music Box, among other things. And the Music Box, some of you might know as a distributor. Some of you might know it as a theater. Uh, the theater came first. None of the original staff are still there because it opened in 1929. And uh, as a theater, it when it opened what was really a fairly uh, unexciting thing. It was a neighborhood movie house with 750 seats, which at that time in 1929 was considered small. And it got, you know, back in the time when you would have first run, second run, third run, fifth run, Music Box might have been like sixth run. Uh, so, so it was very much thought to be nothing special. And at that time, in Chicago, a lot of theaters um, were built in the midst of storefronts. So a very classic thing for a Chicago theater in that time uh, would be something that has a very small profile from the street, but then you get inside of it and it's enormous, right? And then there are apartments and storefronts around it. Um, and as Chris could actually attest, if we wanted to ask him about his uh, upbringing and background, in, in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a lot of consolidation in, in the Chicago art house scene and a lot of longtime theaters um, that had been catering to an art clientele shut down um, or got bought out. And so the music box, which had kind of gone through a number of lives uh, by the time it reopened in the 1980s as kind of a, a double feature house, repertory house, uh, because it's adjacent to Boys Town, it started doing a lot of independent LGBT films. It was at, at many points the, um, the home for Reeling, the Chicago LGBT Festival. Um, it kind of morphed into the main art house in Chicago, and I would say the most desirable one from a distributor's standpoint, which Chris can confirm or deny. Um, and so we added another screen, so now it, it, it's a two screen theater that, that does um, basically everything. First run, midnight, repertory, 70 millimeter, 35 millimeter, silence, one-offs, um, and, and really uh, is an important piece of the cultural fabric of Chicago. And 
I work there with a few hats. I'm uh, the program associate at the theater, which means I, back when we were open and doing more repertory programming, um, I would help with a lot of one-off and repertory events. And then uh, Music Box spun off its own uh, distributor in 2007, uh, which has just been uh, a very prominent art house uh, an international and documentary distributor. Uh, I used to work with Chris when he was at the quad and I would be calling him and calling him and saying, when are you going to book our film? Uh, so, uh, this is a very uh, shared experience for both of us. Um, and at, at, on the film side, I, um, I'm the theatrical sales manager, which up until six months ago meant the very thing Chris is talking about calling theaters and saying, will you book our film? Uh, and then I also work on acquisitions, so go to festivals, watch screener links, recommend, uh, you know, what we do and do not distribute. So um, I have a few hats there, and then I also, um, independent of the music box, I am programmer at Chicago Film Society, which is a freestanding 501c3 organization devoted to uh, analog film exhibition preservation and education. Um, so we do analog screenings on 35 and 16 and occasionally 70 and Super 8 um, around Chicago and have a collection and we're finishing up some photochemical preservation um, right now, including some avant-garde films that are at Color Lab and uh, a, a silent documentary that was found in someone's basement that made its way to us. Um, and so, yeah, that, that I, I have a lot of film stuff in my life right now. Um, and uh, like Chris said, it's really been a transition as a lot of the things that we care about, um, you know, uh, have become very precarious, right? And to Chris's point, um, home entertainment is a big saving grace, not only for Kino, uh, but also for Music Box. And I would hope for women make movies because we do luckily have an audience that's developed outside of, of the theater, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody among all of our friends, whether they're here or whether they're, you know, our compatriots at Magnolia or Strand or, you know, anywhere else, Cinema Guild, you know, none of them, I think, went into the business because they wanted to get their movies on, on, you know, Amazon Prime. Like no one ever says like, that's why I'm like in, in cinema, right? Like everyone says they work in it because of the magic and, and, and singularity of the theatrical experience. And, you know, particularly um, because Music Box is also a theater uh, that, you know, was shut down for a few months and is now reopened, but can only do 50 seats in the 750 seat house. Um, you know, and, and leaving aside the whole question of should we even be open? Uh, when you only have 50 seats, it makes it really hard to do the kind of unique repertory programming and one-off programming where you're paying a lot of money to import a 35 millimeter printer just to ship it from Los Angeles. Um, and so the kind of really unique programming that both Chicago Film Society and the Music Box Theater uh, were known for it, it is just not a practical option right now. And so like Chris, we've all had to be very creative. Um, Music Box Films is also doing some virtual releases. Um, one of them is coming up uh, with Northwest Film Center, um, which is Sybil, which I think Ben is opening on October 1st. Um, and then we're actually doing another virtual release right now uh, at the Hollywood of, of uh, Nomad, the new Werner Herzog film. So, you know, we're trying to figure out how to kind of work within this new paradigm. And to Chris's point, there are certain things that I hope survive uh, and, and certain values and, and priorities that don't need, that, that, that are, that will still hopefully be rational uh, and accepted uh, when COVID passes. But there are other things that I, I would love for us to just not have to deal with anymore and be back to normal. So, so it's a mix. All right, Ben Pop, Director of Artist Services, take it away. Yeah, um, well, thanks everyone. So I um, wanted to start with some of the, the aspects of with the, the virtual um, cinemas as well. And 
specifically for some of the, the people on here that are filmmakers in general, making films or whatnot, um, and some of the, the questions pertaining to um, you all looking at actually acquisitioning of certain works. And, and I'm curious to know if you feel like there's been a, a shift or some sort of change that you're seeing with the virtual model, thinking about audiences who would particularly watch a film in a theater versus online. And if you're seeing any sort of change or adjustment or if it's normal, or if there's audiences that are, are a little bit more towards a particular film that you would normally see larger in a theater but being a little bit smaller online or vice versa, or something in there. Well, I can say that, I mean, it's all been upended, I think. The, the kinds of movies that we tend to thrive on releasing are very hard to launch virtually without the conventional buzz of a film festival run. We're doing a lot of foreign language and independent and documentary movies, I said, they're often very tough in subject matter. Um, they're amazing movies and that's why we, re we release them. We really believe in them, but they require, you know, or they don't require, but we, the way it's always worked is you, we've premiered, these are movies that we've acquired out of the Toronto Film Festival, Cannes, South by Southwest, Tribeca, Sundance, any number of festivals around the country and world. And they play in a number of other festivals, both in big markets and small, and accumulate word of mouth. And people talk about them in person, and then tweet about them on on the internet. And you know, there's an actual like groundswell of support. Critics write about them. It's not quite the same thing anymore, where people can't actually have a face-to-face -face interaction. I think this week would have been the Toronto Film Festival, and it's happening virtually. And a lot of us in the industry are kind of missing that buzz and experience that you get of seeing a movie and discovering it and actually telling someone else about it because that is still so primal and still works so well in terms of spreading excitement about what something is so now we're tasked with how do you launch a movie without that and when you're going exclusively virtual we have a few different kinds of movies because we have movies that were played in physical festivals and were set to come out and then COVID happened. And so they were not able to open in theaters and they had to pivot to a virtual release. We have movies that we've acquired that we know we're gonna go straight to the virtual release. And then we have things that we've acquired that, well, we're hoping that maybe we can wait long enough that theaters will reopen and we'll be able to play them there. This has obviously gone on a lot longer than we've expected it to. So maybe we won't be able to do that. But there are certain titles, there's uh, an Iranian film we have called There Is No Evil that won the Golden Bear at Berlin. It won the top prize at Berlin, a very good film, Iranian film, and it's about execution. It's about state-sponsored execution. That's a hard movie. It's an excellent film, but it's a hard film to sell and talk about and to get people excited about that would benefit from critical praise and word of mouth and people talking about. We don't have that, we don't have the, like the benefit of that anymore. That's That's gone. There are virtual festivals, but Obviously that's different in terms of spreading the word of mouth. So that becomes the challenge, right? Of the things that are gonna do well launching on virtual, I think we've found, and I would love to hear Kendra and Kyle talk about it too, but it's a lot of documentaries that are about niche subjects, things that might have a grassroots groundswell of support where you can really activate audiences in that way. Um, that becomes you know, an easier way of doing it. Whereas traditionally those movies might have been tougher to get into theaters nationwide. We're now able to kind of present those in theaters we never, never would have normally played. And maybe even in parts of the country we never would have normally played. There are only so many theaters in certain states that will even play a movie that's not in English. So you have to kind of, but now it's like, oh, you can play in a lot of different places all over. So there's new kind of ways that we're pivoting and trying to present films to new audiences that maybe won't, aren't seeing the same financial return, but are maybe getting access to people they wouldn't normally have had access to. Yeah, I can, um, we don't do theatrical releases. So our experience is we usually come in we might start talking with a filmmaker while they're doing their theatrical release and it'll be 
part of the whole strategy, but we're, we don't actually book. We've never done the booking and the programming. We're, we're way more on that educational um, part of the picture. Um, in terms of what we've been acquiring, we haven't, I don't think what we've acquired has changed at all. You know, the titles that we are bringing in our catalog are the same titles we would have before. And I actually didn't say before, the main part of our mission is to support films by and about women. Um, so that it's, it, you know, films that have have an activist kind of following as Chris was referring to. Um, that's, that's always been what we do. And it, it has become even more important. We're, um, one of our big releases right now is a film Belly of the Beast by Erica Cohn. And it is about uh, women who are incarcerated in California's prisons and forced sterilization, which if you read the news this week about the forced sterilization in the ICE detention centers, it's the same, it's the same thing, but it was, it was in California prisons and this happens. It's a whole eugenics issue in a lot of, a lot of prisons in a lot of states. So it's one of those films, like what Chris was saying, that um, it can really benefit from from those screenings, that festival release. It would have had a much bigger festival release, but she had to change her whole strategy. Um, she's been super creative and is doing some extra. Um, she's really working with the um, with the groups who are mobilized around the particular issue and she's creating a whole bunch of digital salons and conversations to invite people in with without even showing the film so she's she's generating conversation around the topic and using that to drive some of the um drive people to watch the film in its it, it is having a short digital theatrical release um so that, but she's also doing some other like super creative, like she has a creative drive-in event planned and she's just, you know, she tends to be one of these filmmakers who's, who's really thoughtful around being innovative, but it, those types of things I think are more important now than they've ever been because of this idea of if you can't drive, we rely on the festival buzz of a film and and some of the theatrical work when we're doing the educational it does so much better educationally if there's already conversation about it and the press really matters for all of those reasons so um without that we are having to do way more on the groundwork for the edge for it to let people know about films educationally um we've had to host some of our own not had to but hosting our own virtual screenings and discussions with filmmakers and subjects in the film is another way we're gener we're, we're driving buzz um and and bringing the right people to see the film so that then they will order it and educationally something that has really changed is librarians used to have a lot more discretionary money for collection development and we are finding now that um, most librarians won't order a film unless it's requested by a professor. So there's a lot more. We've always marketed to faculty, but it's even more important now because it has to come. Like I even I was talking to a librarian who purchases a lot of our films yesterday. He wants to buy this one film, but he hasn't had a faculty person request it yet so he's like do you want to here here's a list of faculty i think would request it why don't you go email them and see if that they'll request it <laughs> because he just he's with the bureaucracy from the school he needs it to come to for classroom use um the the budgets and the libraries have been really restricted from that part, point of view and then the other thing i wanted to mention is the museum exhibition has been really strange <laughs> because it's also op They've been trying to use some of the theatrical, some museums have tried to use the theatrical release model, um, the virtual theatrical, like where they'll show a stream and charge the $12 and then get a portion. Um, but some museums will pay a flat fee and show it. It's just, I think they're having a harder time because from the museum exhibition, it was always connected they would show films usually that were connected to some art exhibit and they were trying to get people that were attending the museum to come into their theater and 
watching online in a museum, there's like, there's no difference than watching it online anywhere else. So it seems like that has been challenging unless it's a, a very um, subject specific museum. We have a number of films right now about Native American issues. We have a, a really great one called Without a Whisper that's about the influence of Native American women on the women's suffrage movement in the, the United States. So like we're getting interest from Native American heritage museums. And I think those, a theatrical, I mean, a, a virtual screening will work for them because it's, an, it's such a um, specific audience. Um, but yes, we've totally been finding that rollout. Um, it's very different. It's very, and we're just adapting. It's like what Chris was saying. It's fun on one level from a strategy standpoint. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I get to figure out this new, like, how do we do this? And, but it's also, it's definitely making it a lot harder for the films. Each film requires so much more work and a lot of, like direct outreach and you can only do that for so many films before you get topped out on capacity. Yeah. So I, I think it's actually really instructive even for me to, to hear uh, what Kendra just said, because, you know, Chris and I are coming from a for-profit distribution model and Kendra is coming from a nonprofit 501c3 one but and and one where theatrical isn't even a consideration but in in all of these cases right we have theatrical as kind of the north star uh, and festivals as the north star that makes everything else possible right and the dirty little secret here and chris stop me if i'm speaking out of school i mean a lot of theatrical releases without naming names are, are loss leaders right so like when you actually factor in you know, the cost of printing up posters and shipping out DCPs or 35 prints in an earlier era. When you talk about the cost of doing an opening week New York Times ad, which is one great, great thing about the virtual era, we're not doing print ads in the New York Times anymore. Um, and that's saving a lot of money. Um, you know, ultimately, whether you come out and you break even on that, even for a successful film is an open question. But But the idea usually is that you're building awareness in all of these markets, right? So that when people see it on Netflix or on Amazon, or they see that a Blu-ray is available, they'll be like, oh yeah, I wanted to see that film. My friend told me it was good and I feel guilty that I never saw it. You know, the, the thing that's tough in all this um, is that ultimately you want to make people understand that it's a real film. And what do I mean by a real film? I, I don't mean anything like it's a quality film, it's an acclaimed film, it's a film I like. I just mean that like, you know, I'll date myself a bit. Um, when I was a kid, you could go into Target and whenever the new big Disney movie would come out, like two months beforehand, there would already be some weird knockoff. that's like, The Lion King is coming out. What's this VHS The Lion Cub here in, in the video section? And it's like, it's this cash in about like, well, yeah, some unassuming parent is gonna buy this because they think it's a real movie, but it's not. And in that analogy, like the thing is, we're surrounded by movies or we're surrounded as tech people call it by content, right? And you know, you log into Netflix or you turn on your television and it's movies, movies, movies everywhere. And you're like, did I even hear about this? Like the cast sounds familiar. Like what is this thing, right? And ultimately, what a theatrical release does and a festival release does is it actually builds up an audience that knows about the film. It generates reviews, it generates buzz, it generates chatter on letterbox and on social media. And that is ultimately the important thing because, you know, when Chris or Kendra and I, like whenever we license a movie, we're not licensing it for 18 months, right? We're licensing it usually sometimes seven years, sometimes 10, sometimes a dozen, sometimes 15. I'd like to think that even in the worst case scenario for COVID, the titles that we have now, the majority of the time we have them licensed is not going to be under COVID, right? Like if we have a license for a movie for 12 years, uh, you know, we really, what we do in year one and year two to generate awareness of it, to generate reviews, to generate press, uh, to generate a following for it, basically is important over the life of that license so that 
you know, as I said, eight years from now, when we still own the film and we're still, you know, distributing it, that, that people remember it and, and think it's something that's still worth their time. And, and that's kind of the whole question about a lot of, you know, the, these direct to TVOD or direct to Netflix movies that like, they come in, it's garbage in, it's garbage out. No offense to the actual films or filmmakers, but just like, are you really planting a flag that people will remember? Um, and, you know, we're in a similar situation with Kino where we have some titles that have gone out, um, you know, because they seem to work virtually. Like, as I said, Nomad is an example because it's in English, it's a Werner Herzog film, it's a documentary. There are just, fr from a marketing perspective, a lot of things th that are easier about that. Uh, whereas the kind of traditional art house film that's subtitled that, you know, really needs festivals to legitimate it, uh, to legitimize it and, and to, to build up buzz and, and anticipation, yeah, it's an open question of when that's going to return. And, you know, we have a film right now that we had hoped to release this summer called Emma by Pablo Lorraine. Um, and, you know, it has Gal Garcia Bernal in it, Lorraine directed Jackie and No, and, and a number of other films that have a following. But it's also, I mean, it's a big screen experience. It's the first movie that we ever acquired that has a damn Atmos soundtrack as part of it. We got the delivery on the, the feature file and we were like, it has an Atmos track? We don't even know any theaters that play that, but okay, we'll take it, right? Um, and it would just be, I, I would like to think that if there's any movie designed for the big screen, it's a colorful, enormous, sexy dance movie that, that is Emma. And, and it wouldn't really work as well on, on a laptop. And, you know, the, the other part of this that, that addresses, um, you know, the question that, that Anna um, asked in, in the chat, you know, in terms of just platforms and monitoring them and monitoring the security of them, you know, Chris and Kendra and I know a lot about film and we know a lot about distribution. Before this, I was never asked to evaluate, you know, the security of an IT platform. Like, I don't know. Like you tell me, like every platform emails me and they're like, we are the most secure platform of any of them. All of the studios have told us that we have the best security and we have the best DRM. We have the best this and the best that. I don't have the, the either in myself or among my colleagues, the expertise to actually confirm any of this. Let's talk through that a little bit because I know yeah. that there's some questions and you, it's like you're teeing it up, Kyle. Um, <laughs> there's some questions around that. And Ben, do you want to do you want to maybe read the first one and then we'll we'll kind of dig in because there's some yeah, sure. questions over here. So we got this from old Jesse Blanchard here. He's got a wonderful film. Uh, so wonder about virtual film festivals. What are what are the, some of the concerns around security for streaming and what are if anyone has any thoughts on view counts for a virtual festival? Should a filmmaker limit the view count or not? This is, um, well, uh, did everyone hear the horrible news that just happened? I don't want to break it to people, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg just died. Um, oh. So oh. I feel like oh. we should just say that in case you didn't hear it. Um, oh. hard, uh, hard to talk about movies. With that, I just saw it, just want to acknowledge it and be like, what the hell? Um, yeah. You can say fuck, Chris. You're from New York. It's okay. I, I'm trying to not not work blue here, but uh, yeah. Work blue. Uh, oh. Yeah. So just want to clear the room in case anyone probably already saw that if, on their phones. I just did. Um, yeah, we can talk about festivals. <laughs> uh, it's a very practical question. I know. Fuck. It's horrible. It's the worst possible thing we could all hear. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with it. Um, in terms of film festivals, Jesse, very practically, I think as a distributor, we've had a very hard time um, dealing with it and that very question because normally it's, like I said, there's been a pattern of how this stuff has worked. You know where you're playing, you know the theaters, you know the number of seats, you know the terms that it's always been, you know how things have always worked. 
now it's a very different ball game and it's like well what's the fee that's being paid what's the number of views like you said for something um it's something where we're thinking about it we don't really know the answer either it's very difficult right now to know like uh, every platform that reputable festivals are using event hive cinescend shift 72 they're all really good um and they are trustworthy so your movie's not going to be kind of taken from it so that's kind of out of the way i think for any of those um in terms of the issue of it um being sorry it's hard to focus in with all of this um in terms of it being uh like number of views and in a market that's like the kind of thing that we're always thinking about as a distributor do you want to do word of mouth screenings before a movie comes out um do you you know like there's no exact science to it unfortunately it'd be so much better if there was it's always the question of do you want to get a ton of people to see your movie before it comes out because then a lot of people will be talking about it and there'll be a lot of buzz and word of mouth and then more people want to see it or do you not want a lot of people to see it because then that will exhaust your entire audience beforehand um and those are things that we constantly think about in the physical realm and now in the virtual as well um again it comes down to press i think and a lot of questions of attention that you can sort of get that add value to the movie and increase awareness. If you're playing at a festival in a major city and there are film critics who are willing and able to write about the movie and devote their precious you know, column inches or virtual space to the movie, then that's great. That can add a lot of value. That one review can go a really long way to tipping off other people about the movie and, and going somewhere. So we're trying to keep it in the lower range, a couple hundred, and we're trying not to have it, you know, we're trying to have them be geo-blocked as well. So people only in a particular region can see the movie because sometimes with the virtual festivals and things, if it's not geo-blocked, someone in another state can see it and you exhaust an audience in another part of the country. And you also want to be able to be true to what the festival is, you know, so it's hard. Do you do a block by state? Is it for all of California? But what if they're on the eastern side of California? Are you adding Nevada as well? Are you adding Oregon? You know, and those are questions that we're working out on a case by case basis and figuring out. But, um, you know, I, I do think that um, it's good to be able to be able to get some money from a festival if you're a filmmaker. I think that's really good and distributor as well. It's important to us because the word of mouth question is such a big question mark right now in a way that it wasn't before where we, the value is more clear and uh, like obvious right there in front of us. And now it's, um, you know, it's, it's more unknown. Well, and, and to, to regards with some of those questions and um, people's um, wonderings about what to do, um, jumping into, you know, some of Devin's questions here are, um, Regarding to if uh, from your all's perspective, I know both Kendra from the educational side pointed to is if um, you recommend the independent films try to get press materials beforehand um, uh, beforehand uh, or after you re acquired the film and likewise, you know, after the film goes forward. Um, at what point in the film cycle do you see it going into like an educational route. Um, year after the theatrical, two, three. Um, uh, also, like Chris, I saw that come on my phone and was uh, very, very stunned. And that's I'm going to be processing that while I'm talking. Um, but the the press is it's so helpful when a filmmaker has a good press agent and that they're. Um, they're being thoughtful about using that press agent. And actually we have found people who are hiring good press agents, even in the, for the virtual festivals have gotten good press. Um, so I think it's, if you're hiring someone who knows how to pitch the story, um, then the virtual festivals have still been really successful in that way. Um, we don't hire press agents for the film so it, it it is the filmmaker who's doing that while they're doing that part of their release strategy 
Um, but we see such a difference with the films that do that. Um, and we do, we do find that very helpful. In terms of the time frame from theatrical to education, I just think, well, in this time, it's collapsed completely. Um, we have a film that is already, well, I mentioned Belly of the Beast. We're releasing it educationally and it's doing its theatrical run. The, um, it doesn't, there's not a window. Um, in a normal world, there, it would usually follow very quickly after the theatrical. Um, but that has collapsed m more and more over time. And often what it has been is that you just can't let a school do a campus screening in a t in a city that has a scheduled uh, a scheduled theatrical showing, but it would be okay if a if a professor showed it in their class in that city. Um, the campuses tend to be more closed closed in that way, and usually we haven't seen a lot of conflict around it. Um, so we it's for us it's educationally it's really helpful to get it as quickly as possible, even as simultaneous if possible, or as quickly right after, and to have the have the conversation about your with your educational distributor at the outset, so that it's all part of your strategy. Um, because then you're going to want to go to to a platform, and if you want to do SVOD, you need to give a window. You need to give at least six months. In an ideal world, you'll give nine nine months to a year um, before you go SVOD so that you give education some time. And if you go, so if you went really quickly to SVOD after theatrical, you miss your educational time frame. So that would be my, that would be what I'd say. Uh, so like Chris and like Kendra, um, this is very devastating news that makes the relative press and, and uh, you know, uh, fee return on, on festival engagements uh, very insignificant. Um, but in the interest of answering these questions, which will be uh, relevant no matter what kind of hellscape the country is in, um, you know, I'm of the school of thought that press is never bad. Um, and, and I say that because there's a very old school view, right, that if there's a festival, you have to uh, require the, if you allow the film to be screened for press, they only have to do capsules because in the world where there were influential alt weeklies, if they review it in the festival, they're not going to do a full review again whenever it comes out. And that's great, but the fact of the matter is there are fewer and fewer opportunities for conventional press. There are fewer and fewer guarantees, uh, even in kind of the big metro papers, uh, that a film will even get reviewed. Like the LA Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post don't review everything anymore. The New York Times threatens not to review everything anymore, but they generally still do. But like, I look at that and it's like, okay, maybe if you allow your film to be reviewed out of a festival, uh, it one outlet has already reviewed it and won't review it again. And in a world that is a traditional media world where someone doesn't know about a movie until they open the newspaper on Friday morning and see your review in the calendar section, then you, you, you've blown your shot. But frankly, that's not the world that we're in now. And to even get reviewed uh, is an uphill battle when again, there are so many movies and so many kind of changing standards of what gets reviewed. I mean, uh, years ago, it was a scandal that a Netflix movie that wasn't playing in theaters even got reviewed, uh, and now it's not, and that's just what it is, right? And so you, I think, have to balance the idea of a press blackout with what you could potentially get, because I, I don't want to speak for Chris or Kendra, but, you know, if we do see a film, even a film that we like, that's gone through a lot of festivals, and hasn't yet gotten the reviews that would elevate it. Because, right, like, in the world before 2020, when TIFF had 300 films a year, it's great to say, to have the laurels from the Toronto International Film Festival, but 299 other films also have those, and not all of them get distribution, right? Like, a lot of things go the festival route and still don't wind up uh, with distribution because there's a finite amount of attention, there's a finite amount of films that work for the prices that, that 
we would be able to pay. And so I think that, you know, getting a good, um, getting good press out of festivals is of paramount importance, whether you're self-distributing, whether you are um, trying to sell to a distributor, d d depending on what, like, I, I just, I don't think there's ever been a film that's been hurt because it got a good review before it came out. And like, there are times when we struggle with films that, you know, didn't really get seen much and we're waiting on the campaign. And Chris, I think can speak to this. It's like, you know, you have a good film, but it wasn't reviewed very widely with festivals. So even when you're putting together the poster, you don't have a lot of good options for a pull quote. And you're like, God, I really hope the New York Times review comes through and is good. But if it does, it's coming through on Thursday. We're opening the film on Friday and you, you can't build that awareness and that anticipation. Um, so I'd actually want to kick it back to Chris for his thoughts on, on that. I, I, I do. I just want to make sure that we're getting to the questions that are that are there. I feel like this is one of those that um, could go on for three hours and we'd all learn everything. It's like a master class in distribution and, and, you know, in this moment. So, you know, you guys are so thoughtful to even just, you know, talk about the things you're talking about. But I think, you know, some of the things that we're seeing up here um, also have to do, I'll, I'll kind of make a bigger mold for some of these to drop into is, you know, around digital um, or virtual distribution. It's not even digital now, it's virtual, right? It just sounds sexier. Um, and I know that there's questions around that, both around festivals and around actual releases. And I'm sure you all are struggling with it in each of your areas um, around user friendliness and also around geo-blocking, right? So I think those are two things that, you know, as we only have a few more minutes of time, um, how do those work? And how has revenue share for our filmmakers also been affected? Um, you know, as as you said, Chris, sometimes yeah, you acquire things, and the, there's a there's a back end or you know money's up front in terms of the deal, and then other times um, we've been working with some distributors who are like, yeah, you know, when we get the money, it's a revenue split that we're sending to filmmakers as well because we're trying a new model. So if you could maybe cover a little bit about geo blocking revenue share and as you're doing these virtual screenings how those things have shifted i think that might be a good place to to end up on because i think that those are like the the meat of the meat and potatoes questions yeah um for revenue share generally um the terms have been sort of different in virtual than they have been for physical theatrical exhibition because it, it tends to be that um, the theaters end up taking more of the money in traditional theatrical. Uh, we're getting a smaller percentage and it's a little more even because it's on both of us now. A lot of the expenses that used to exist don't exist, like Kyle said, the New York Times ads or a lot of these other things, um, these burdens that, you know, theaters have. Um, I, I think what we're talking about is generally it's about the profile of the movie and it's about how to make it if most of you guys are filmmakers i mean it's i want this to be as useful to everyone as possible so it's like if most of the people here are filmmakers which is great that's really good to know because i can speak to like that very specifically if you are a filmmaker your goal is to create a profile for your movie and to be able to make another movie because then you get to, you have attention, you have people who wanna give you money for something else, you get to make another movie and you keep building that and it turns into a career and you're able to keep going. So the way to do that is by, you know, getting your movie seen by critics, getting it seen by distributors, getting it put out into the world, putting it in someone's hands who you trust and who will do that work. And for us as a distributor, it's important for us to, for that the movie have a life. We want our filmmakers to have a life as well. We want you to keep making movies because, you know, we're in the business of putting out the first or second movies by great filmmakers because we can't afford their fourth or fifth movies because we're the ones who are creating that profile and doing the work and elevating them. Kino back in the day put out the first films by Wong Kar Wai. A new Wong Kar Wai movie is gonna be an Amazon Studios movie and we can't afford that, you know? It's, he's a major national filmmaker, but we were the people and we all are on the grounds who are doing the work in order to elevate them, create the profile, say this is who this person is, this is the work. So I think that on those first or second movies, 
now in terms of new deals and how things are being with the revenue share, it's difficult to say because it's still all very in flux. You know, I, I want to say that it's all figured out and it's all easier, but there was more of a set path with the contracts and the terms and everything previously. I think that is not there anymore. So as a filmmaker, you might have more leveraging power with a distributor, maybe, honestly, to say, you know, this is a whole new world. We don't know how this is working out. Um, but it, like Kyle was sort of, I mean, it behooves, you know, if you're gonna spend money on anything as a filmmaker playing at festivals, doing things, a press agent, I think is really great. Having a really good independent publicist is probably the best expense you, you can put your money toward if you have any money to, because Kyle's exactly right. There's no such thing as too much good press. If your movie is good, if your movie is really good, it will continue to be written about and talked about and it will just keep going. And that is a really exciting and great thing if you can have it. And it goes beyond the trades. Like he said, sometimes a movie plays at a festival, gets reviewed by Variety and The Hollywood Reporter. And we don't have any other reviews beyond that because it's it's only played, it's, you know, it's only been reviewed by those sources. You want it to be seen by more people widely. Those quotes, they help something. When you're up and coming, I feel like it's a groundswell it is a word of mouth thing. The more people see it, the better. Um, and as a filmmaker, we're putting out a movie called Test Pattern, for example, which is a really excellent movie, which is a very small, small, you know, it's like movies get called small, which is bullshit because it's a budget thing, but it's like, it's not small, it's big in its themes and its value and how good it is, but it's small by the terms of it. And it's about uh, an African-American woman who gets sexually assaulted and the repercussions of that. And it's a remarkable movie. It's very tense and gripping and everything she has to deal with systematically that she's going through. That's a movie that has not played major festivals, let's say. It, is not, it did not play at Cannes, it did not play at Berlin, it did not play at Sundance. But it's an excellent movie and it found its way to our desk by playing at a number of regional festivals. And I think it came to us through a recommendation. And that's great. And we watched it and we we're like, this is incredible. And this movie is, I think, going to get a lot of attention and really create a profile for this filmmaker. So it's about creating something on your own and then trusting other people to kind of come in with you, whether it's women make movies, whether it's music box or, you know, like it's a distributor on any kind of level. And that, you know, we all want the movies to succeed because then we all are winning when that happens. And so we're all kind of working toward that. I'll just kind of, wrap this up and say that there were so many good details in what you just said, Chris, and just watching um, some of our filmmakers here and some of the filmmakers that we know outside of um, Portland Metro, you know, some of the things you were saying about recommendations at this moment, um, I think that's the best thing that if you have a feature film that you're trying to get out in the world, have some champions, whether that's fellow filmmakers or whether that's folks that are a few years career wise down the path than you, it helps tremendously to have someone just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know that movie in your pile of 40 movies that you're supposed to be watching? Seriously, it's amazing. So that's one thing. And then the second is, you know, and, and in the spirit of uh, RGB as well, it's like you have to blaze your own path. These folks are working extremely hard that you're talking to here and are also trying to figure it out and also try and pivot and also try and deal with anxious bosses and investors and all of the things that that come with it, right? It's not an either or. We are all totally in, interested in figuring out new ways of seeing new models for doing things and getting new voices out there. But it really is that we have to be our own engine and fight for what's good and your work is good. And you all have amazing things to say and share, not just because you're here in the Northwest, but because you know, you're, you're hardworking artists. And I think these are your advocates and if anybody really appealed to you in this call, send them a quick note and let them know. Just, hey, how are you? And I have this cool film coming out and just be on the lookout. It's a start, right? There's no guarantees in life, but it's a start. And I think that's a good place to leave this, uh, leave this on. We really could have gone another hour. Um, I, for one, need to go pour a glass of wine because I am devastated. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry that that had to happen during this call. I'm sorry it had to happen, period, but there's nobody else I'd rather be with at this moment. Um, so thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Kyle. As always, Ben in December for bringing us all together. And 
Tim and his beard for uh, keeping us all together. Um, we appreciate you. So if you have questions, if you have anything that you wanted to, to get out, out of your system and you didn't get to share, reach out either to us or to Kendra, Kyle, and Chris, and we'll make sure we get your question answered. So thanks everyone for a great, another great happy hour.